Hey everyone and welcome back to another roundup. So, Twitch has uh, basically caught fire with the DMCA. Bungie have gone hot water for, well, throwing a bunch of their game in the bin for the greater good. It's an interesting situation. And there's a bunch more, of course. Stadia have suffered yet another blow. What a surprise. We may see another Akami and uh, even more stuff as well. A lot to talk about, so be sure to hit that like button and that sub button. Seriously, helps us out with the YouTube bots, which is pretty important. And with that, let's just get right into the video. First up today, we've got a wild situation on Twitch who are in a bit of a rough spot after waves of DMCA notices went out against streamers from the Recording Industry Association of America, RIAA. Now, this is on clips between 2017 and 2019 that have background uh, music on them, and it's actually the first mass wave of DMCAs that Twitch say they've seen in this manner. Now, here's the thing here. Clips do not mute copyrighted content like live stream VODs do, and that means that it's a clear vulnerability and of of course, attack path for the RIAA. And this is one that's made much worse by there being no tools to like quickly delete loads of clips. It's got to be done manually, which is really quite challenging. Now, look, the thing here is part of the problem is that the DMCA is old. It's pre-streaming legislation and really anyone with copyrighted content, be it a game dev, music, uh, you know, like a music rights holder, they can use the DMCA to take down whatever they want, right? I could probably use it if somebody like reacted to one of my videos because my face is in it. And the whole way that that would work is that even if I had no fair use, uh, like fair use basis, or like if there was a fair use basis for the other person to use my image, well, it's a sort of fire first, ask questions later. And that's one of the tricky things that makes this such an exploitable system because content platforms are actually legally compelled to act whenever they do get a request. Then gaming attorney Noah Downs takes it further saying that actually the music industry has invested in a means to monitor live streams and that they could issue DMCAs live if they wanted to, but right now they just don't. So that's really quite wild and certainly something that's big for streamers. A lot of streamers have seen, well, channels go down, which is obviously pretty rough for livelihoods and stuff. Now, how do you solve this, right? I mean, the most obvious market answer is that, you know, opening Spotify for the sake of personal listening is quite different from the sake of it being the radio on your stream. So do you open up a business subscription to actually fit that type of usage? But the thing that then is, if you actually look into how rights work there, that would be extremely tricky to implement. Though, if you're in a situation where that music is adding value to your product as a streamer, then yeah, I suppose it does sort of make sense or be some sort of financial cut for the rights holders of that music, right? even though that's very much against the sort of freebooting piratey nature of, uh, you know, just having banter with your mates in the internet, which really is the core texture of streaming that people actually like. So it really is quite challenging. It's very hard to tell what is the best solution here, other than to right now just use game music for maybe the game that you're playing or something like that, which of course, for a lot of people will have a diminished entertainment value. But what we do know is that right now the DMCA is a exploitable mess, as we have seen in so many instances. And then we also know, of course, that the RIAA are a really ruthless bunch when they want to be. And, uh, well, I hate to think about how far they could go if they do have the capability to issue DMCAs live. That is kind of crazy. And with that said, I want to know what you think about this story. And next, let's talk about what's going on with Destiny 2 and why many think that Bungie have got themselves in a bit of hot water. Okay, so Bungie did their big live stream to announce future plans, and I'm going to go over the news bit quickly, and then we'll get into the reason why people are a bit pissed, because it is, I think, philosophically rather interesting. So, Destiny 2 Beyond Light is in 2020, The Witch Queen is in 2021, and Lightfall is in 2022. So they're just continuing that idea of the big sort of yearly expansion size DLC, and then, of course, having seasons in between that. And yes, they also announced the fourth and final season of, like, the current sort of year of the game. And overall, this lines up with Destiny 3 either not being a thing or being very, very much in the far future. And what we know is that this idea of doing a sustainable live game, what Bungie are trying to do now, uh, that's what they wanted to do. But the push and pull between that and having big, big annual releases with DLC packs, that was actually a major point of contention between Activision and between Bungie. So you can now see that with Activision not being in the picture anymore, Bungie 
are changing their strategy, right? They're trying to run this as more of a live service, which I think does make a lot of sense for what Destiny is. I mean, look, I come from the World of Warcraft side of things where you pay your sub fee and then you get, you know, maybe between two and three decently sized patches per year. Uh, so that's kind of what Bungie want to be doing there. So they're just running it like more of a live game, which I think does make sense. But it also brings us on to the little bit of drama. Uh, well, okay, this is interesting. So they are vaulting content and that means that they are removing content from the game. Now, the idea of them saying vaulting is sort of that they can take that content and bring it back into the game or reuse it in the future. But the core here is that Titan, Mercury, Io, and Leviathan are all being vaulted. They will no longer be in the game and the same goes for their associated content. And then Destiny 1 content, some of which um, has not actually been ported over yet, that is also classed as being vaulted and may return in the future. Now, this is quite interesting, okay? And this, I mean, this includes, like, say, the campaigns. Like, the base Destiny 2 campaign is going to be vaulted. Now, the reason why they're doing this is that they have this problem, right? Where they keep on adding things into the game. But those things, of course, they've got to be viable in terms of the rewards and all of that stuff. But then you've got this problem where the game is getting so large and so unwieldy that as a developer to actually keep all of those things maintained and working, it's kind of challenging. But then also from a game design perspective, you just have this incredibly broad situation with your game where so much of the content barely even matters or isn't even played by players, but still sort of exists there in the world. And then basically it, you know, the game ends up being just sort of this big mess mess, right? Like you've just kept on adding to this meal every single, you know, every single season. And now you're in a situation where a player opens up the game and they have zero idea what to do. And even for experienced players, yeah, they know what to do. They can get all their weekly things done. But a part of that's because they know what not to do because so much of the content is irrelevant. So basically what Bungie wants to do is to be able to vault content so that they can more tailor the end game experience to be what makes sense for the game as it is right now. And here's what I will say about this. From a game design perspective, I actually think that this makes quite a bit of sense. And if you log into Destiny 2, you can sometimes find out that it is a big old mess. However, that is very different. That's more of a problem-solving oriented game design perspective. If you then flip that over to the consumer's perspective, they're saying, well, you know, I purchased Destiny 2, a video game, and now parts of that are going away. What? You know, they don't see it like they have purchased a ticket into Bungie's theme park, right? And that, you know, your, your different tickets that you purchase get you different things. They don't really see it that way, right? And I mean, I think that's how people probably should see it. That's what's really challenging here. Now, I think that Bungie's reasoning basically all does stand up to logic and reason, but it sort of struggles when you just think about it in very basic principles where it's like, yeah, there was content in the game. There's now not going to be content. I mean, why would you, you know, why vault that stuff? Maybe what you could do is have that still be playable for people who want that content, but maybe just uh, make it clear that it's not the current season stuff, like maybe the wildcard system in, uh, in Hearthstone. I'm not 100% sure there, but basically it's an interesting philosophical debate where what feels right comes up against game development reality and because of that, I would love to know what you think about the story. Now, there is one final tidbit. The game will run at 4K60 on the new consoles. That is interesting for two different reasons. Number one, that's actually pretty darn impressive in terms of performance. But then the number two thing I would also say is you've got to remember that Destiny 2 is an incredibly well-optimized game. Seriously, it's insane how well that game runs on um, even medium hardware. So I'm not surprised that, like, of all games that could be brought over to those systems, that it would would be the one to achieve 4K 60. Anyway, with that, let's move on. Well, much to Google's dismay, it seems like Cyberpunk 2077's sizable delay is not allowing for a simultaneous launch on all platforms. And while the game is set to release on time for PC, PS4, and Xbox One, on Stadia, it's going to be by the end of the year. It was a pretty quiet confirmation from CD Projekt Red, actually. Uh, but nevertheless, this is terrible news for Stadia. I mean, they've been using Cyberpunk 2077 to promote their AAA lineup for months, and now that's, well, delayed, which is a bad look. There's no official reason for this delay, but I would imagine that Stadia just wouldn't, it just wouldn't be worth the extra effort if extra effort was needed, especially after Take-Two's Strauss Zelnick admitted that Stadia, you know, for all the games that they brought over to Stadia, like Red Dead Redemption 2, a game that's super hard to run, so maybe is an ideal use case for Stadia. I mean, Strauss basically said, yeah, Stadia, we didn't notice, you know, it didn't impact sales of our titles. 
that's obviously a terrible look. And I think it means that Stadia will continue to struggle in this area because they don't really have that much of an audience and their business model does not make that much sense as we have covered many times before. So this is a bad look for Stadia. It's one that should inspire introspection. I think they should basically scrap their entire business model. I think their core technology is really good, but they need to work out how they can apply that technology in a way that actually makes sense for customers as a product. And right now they are not succeeding at doing that. The next up, a rough situation for Nintendo where they've revealed that an additional 140,000 user accounts were illegally accessed during a security breach earlier in the year. Now, back in April, they confirmed an estimated 160k, so with this update, it's now 300k, which is pretty insane, although Nintendo are adamant that credit card info was not obtained. Now, Nintendo claimed that less than 1% of the illegally accessed accounts were used to make purchases, but um, and then they will, of course, be doing refunds for everybody affected. Obviously, though, that is really bad. Now, following that April breach, Nintendo have taken steps to increase account safety. They've disabled Nintendo network IDs as a login mechanism. They've encouraged two-factor authentication, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, with the impact of the breach, though, being far more extensive than anticipated, it'll be interesting to see whether, like, Nintendo tighten their security further or offer just more there, more options for people. Certainly is a rough situation, though. And then finally for today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about games, because we've got uh, some rumors, some fun. Okay. Okami 2. This is the rumor. This week, uh, Akumi Nakamura, of course, of E3 f uh, fame, right? With his, you know, she was the one that really um, sort of captured the public imagination in that presentation. Well, she announced that she is planning to pitch an Okami sequel to Capcom once the world becomes normal again. Now, she was an artist on the original game, and she says she's confident that Capcom will be on board with the plan, telling IGN Japan the chances are, quote, pretty high that she'll get project approval. So, yes, Okami 2. If this does happen, it would be incredible. Uh, Okami is fantastic. I think a sequel, importantly, one that is led by people from the original team. I think that would be incredible, right? You know, Okami, like, there's just aspects of that game that are so iconic. There's also a few rough edges, so seeing what they could do with a sequel now with modern tech, that would be really cool. I mean, come on, imagine how crisp that art style would look on modern hardware. It really would be a treat. So, there you go, Okami 2. Then finally, two confirmations. So, Battlefield 6, it has been confirmed that it's going to be in a modern setting. So, not World War 1, not World War 2, but modern. Of course, Battlefield 3 was a modern set game. Battlefield 4 was as well. BF4 had a really awful launch, but Actually, after two years of DLC, like, Battlefield 4 was in a super, super strong position. I think it's actually quite widely played today. So I've got to imagine that they see the stickiness of BF4 for players and they want to recapture that. I'd also think that if they're going back to modern after a long time, I have to wonder, will that be almost a bit of a reboot, right, for, for the franchise? So I think that's all quite interesting. Um, obviously, Battlefield has had extreme issues. If you want to see my big post-mortem of BF5, it's a long-ass video, but if you're into that... I think you might enjoy it. Uh, so there's that. Then finally, Far Cry 6 is set to be announced July 12th in an exotic setting. So there you go. A Far Cry game in an exotic setting. What a surprise. I guess that means we're moving, you know, away from American Midwest and maybe to some sort of island or, you know, just some place that we've not seen before. So there you go. That is basically what's going on there. Then, of course, there's a little bit more. And um, there were actually some rumors about the Xbox, like, dates shifting for their big reveals. Turns out that's not actually the case and they're not shifting dates. And then for Sony, that has been um, re-announced to be the 11th of June. So very soon. And uh, we're already seeing, you know, some people just sort of say, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I've been working on a game for two years. How about you go check out that uh, Sony event? So I think if you're into video games, you're probably going to get a lot of announcements very quickly indeed. Anyway, that is it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to try something a bit different, check out our video on the sort of fan-led indie games that are taking on the their AAA contemporaries, and then, of course, yesterday's video, which I think you'll find quite interesting, too. Thank you for watching, and with that, I'll see you next time.